so many of you joining today. Uh, my name is Audrey Pop. Uh, I'm working at European Schoolnet, uh, and I'm going to be moderating this session. Uh, I also have here um, our speaker today, Esther. Uh, she, I will introduce her uh, later on a bit more in detail. And also, uh, under the host EUN account, I have a, a colleague of mine, Anastasia. So if you have any technical problems, you can uh, write her in a private chat, and she will be trying to help you with any technical difficulties. OK, so let me start with introducing a little bit of the webinar. And then uh, Esther will have a presentation of about 40, 45 minutes. And then in the end, we will have 15 minutes for uh, questions. So please feel free to ask uh, any questions. During the webinar, we will collect all of the questions and uh, address them at the end, as many as we can. So uh, looking forward to your active participation as well. OK. So today's webinar is co-organized by STEM Alliance and Scientix two projects that address uh, STEM teachers across Europe and beyond. And these two projects are also co-organizing this popular uh, campaign, the STEM Discovery Week. So I want to tell you shortly about that. The STEM Discovery Week 2019 will take, well, is taking place uh, on 22nd to 28th April, but it has already launched. Um, so you can already participate in the campaign by um, going online and on the Scientix website you can find all the details of the campaign. So if you're organizing any type of STEM activities, STEM um, actions, you can register it on the STEM Discovery Week map. And this will also be featured on various websites of our partners so your activity and your action will be uh, displayed uh, on uh, many different platforms, giving you nice visibility and your STEM actions. So um, if you're organizing any anything between February and April this year, then please go ahead and participate in the campaign. There will also be, um, for example, webinars with the STEM Alliance and with other projects uh, and other opportunities that you can look forward to. Um, yeah, I hope that it's it, going to uh, be a successful experience for you as well to to participate in this Europe-wide uh, initiative. Let me then go ahead and introduce our speaker a little bit. So today we have here with us, as, as I said, Esther Schroer-Villa. Uh, she's a customer success specialist for Cisco Digital Network Architecture. Uh, Esther has a master's degree in telecommunications engineering and joined Cisco in September 2007 in the graduate program for technical services. She worked on switching platforms, storage platforms, and later specialized in data center support. From 2011 to 2014, she was working as a technical account manager and uh, participated in several projects with advanced services. At the end of 2014, she moved to data center solution team in technical services as a team leader and engineer. And from 2016 to 2018, she was working in service enablement as technical service advisor for global services providers, uh, where she had the opportunity to contribute to the development of new offers, better understanding of customer needs, and the delivery challenges. Um, currently, she started her new adventure in a customer success organization as a customer success specialist uh, for Cisco Digital Network Architecture. And she's driving the Cisco transformation to new business models and is passionate about bridging the gap between business and technology. In addition, she has two CCIE and executive MBA. She's innovation ambassador leads inclusion and collaboration initiative and is the 2014 European Digital Women of the Year. So um, many experiences to bring to us today uh, in this webinar. Uh, the purpose of this webinar today is to give teachers, career counselors, educational authorities and researchers an understanding of careers which can be developed in the STEM field. 
Uh, Esther will um, explain about her professional evolution and how she managed to stay relevant in times of change. As you can see from the title of the webinar as well, this will be our topic today and she will show us how uh, different tools that she uses keep her learning on track and why diversity is important and how to be an entrepreneur. We will now, the present, we will now start the presentation and as I said, Please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we will be collecting these and uh, addressing as many as we can at the end of the presentation in the last 15 minutes. So um, I would give you now the floor, Esther, and uh, enjoy your presentation. Everyone enjoy the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. So do you hear me properly? We, yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, a big kudos for all the organization uh, and the initiative, right? Because I think that that is very important to link uh, both, right? Like the uh, education plus the real life experience. Um, and today I'll explain it uh, a bit in a way how I live my life, right? And one of the things I'm always thinking uh, when we start or I, I start something new, right? That is big. And it's very daunting. I think a lot of the things that um, are happening at the moment are really big words, right? When uh, people speak about artificial intelligence or machine learning or some of the technology evolutions that we are seeing at the moment, how can you ever get into a point where you are comfortable and you are an expert in these fields, right? And to myself, I always uh, tell, right, a journey of thousand miles starts with a single step, right? So I think for me, the most important is always to start the journey, to start doing this step. And then today, hopefully I can give you maybe some tools that even if the journey is long, if uh, it's not very clear where we will be in 20 years, right? It helps you to manage it. Um, and I think we'll start uh, knowing a bit about myself uh, and when I was born and what I studied. I think the first years uh, of my uh, studies were a bit uh, standard, let's say, right? Because you're really in the school, uh, you follow a curriculum. In Spain, the curriculums are quite set up. You can actually uh, get some extra signatures and so on. But uh, generally, you have a clear path. Maybe it's not always that clear where you will be able to work afterwards, uh, but I think it's quite set up. What I have seen, though, is that in the last years, that has changed a bit, right? You really need to get this kind of tools, I think, much earlier in the career. So to, to allow the youngsters to really shape themselves to what the industry needs, but be able to change also skills very, very quickly, right? So we'll discuss about it a bit uh, and see if I can give you my point of view. And after that, uh, we will discuss about uh, Brussels and then how did I get involved into all these kind of initiatives but also how all of those actually contribute in what I want to be in my career. And I do believe that helped me out to, to be where I am today, right? Uh, so that's myself. Uh, I was born in a small town, 6,000, 7,000 people now, uh, called Alpicat. Alpicat is uh, in the Lleida province, uh, and that's in Catalonia, uh, Spain. And that's myself by my sister, I mean, normal, town life, uh, my parents are farmers. Um, we always had a really strong working ethic, right? Because uh, if you know something about farming during the summer, you wake up in the early, very more in the morning, very early, you finish uh, quite late, you have a bit of a siesta in between. But I would say uh, it, it's a hard life, right? It took me not more than a year to discover that farming was not the, the thing I wanted to do. The town itself didn't evolve uh, a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. There has been some construction, but I was very fortunate because I think it's a very nice environment, like friends and family are very close. Um, the school is also very close to the family. So you really have like the, this family bringing up. And at that time, kind of everything is possible. I think one of uh, my nicest memories was when a teacher of mine right, was explaining, oh yeah, there is like these careers and uh, there is 
informatics and telecommunica telecommunications and telecommunications is so difficult. I mean, everybody is engineering. Yeah, you need to be so good and so on. And I was thinking to myself, oh, that's that's impossible, right? How am I gonna get to this level to be able to go and do this in engineering? It's too complicated. But then actually at the time when I had to choose my career, I looked into, okay, what do I like? Uh, I actually, I really like technology. I really like how things work, right? I don't like so much the programming or the informatic, but also the communication between things and how can we make an impact in people's life. And for that, I actually choose uh, my career, right? At that time, telecommunication, that was done uh, in Barcelona. So, so there is what I moved. And I did what I think in American terms, you will have like a minor and a major, right? So like a specialization and a overall career. I think this is not the case anymore. You just have like one specialization, but I did three years of the specialization and that was uh, telematica. And then the full career was five years. I mean, to be honest, super experience. I think the first year we could manage to have a bit of a social life. The second and third year was pretty much just like studying on the time. And at the end, we could actually uh, enjoy a bit. And as I say, that was uh, quite a standard, right? Kind of interesting things going on, uh, but not the, the amount of change that I list I've seen in the last 15 years. Uh, one of the things I actually, I've been always very happy uh, to join is the Network at Cat Academy. So there I was able, or I was in the academy for three years, and that was like a, an option that the university gave you to have a bit more kind of practical um, experience kind of uh, on what is going on in the network. So you had your lab setup, set up, you were able to configure networks. I mean, things that you could actually go and use, right? So I thought that was um, very interesting. On top of that, you could actually get the, the certifications, right? So we had, uh, I mean, here is the new certifications. When I did it, I think there was like one CCNA uh, and four CCMPs. But uh, at the moment, I think there is like about 10 different CCNA specializations. And then there is uh, the CCMP, there is several of them as well. Uh, and at this time, I had a bit the same flashback uh, that I explained to you in the school, right? The teacher told us, you know, this expert specialization is so difficult. You actually need to go to Brussels to make it. And um, you, it's like eight hours exam. The theoretical exam is so complicated and so on. And to myself, I thought, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do it. How am I going to go to Belgium to actually have the exam? And it's so complicated, it's impossible. And actually, currently, I do hold uh, two a specialized well, expert uh, CCIs, right? Routing and switching and data center. So that was kind of a bit another daunting moment that I thought it is too difficult. But I told to myself, okay, if there is thousands of people that do it, why shouldn't I be able to do it, right? So I went for it. At this time, I was also very fortunate to be uh, a teacher in the network academy. So I found that something that um, I really like quite a lot. You have a lot of opportunities to be part of the experience, right? To be part of uh, delivering this curriculum. And I do believe that once you are able to actually explain and teach something, that's when you really know what you are talking about, right? So that means for me, all the kudos to, to all the teachers on the call, because I think that is when you really have this, uh, the knowledge uh, assimilated, right? So that's why I always, a very good experience I like to go through. So for the Network Academy, uh, Simon, a colleague of mine, had actually uh, put this uh, out there, right? So the Net Academy, the locator, you can see which academy is in your area if you are interested to join. And then you can also join for free in the link that uh, he created. And you have uh, free resources there. Now, uh, everybody surely heard about cybersecurity, right? So that's very, very important. And to be honest, um, a resource where we struggle a lot, even in Cisco, to find good talent, uh, not just um, in the public sectors, but in the in the private sector is one of the 
the requirements that, that we need. Cybersecurity is, is very important. Uh, not just cybersecurity, there is a lot of technical profiles that uh, are not there at this point at the, in the market, right? I think everybody speak about uh, a lack of uh, STEM talent, uh, and I can tell you that is uh, is real life. That's something that uh, we we are we, I mean we are missing to create expertise or, or good engineers in that. And I think one of the reasons is that things are changing very very quickly, right? So to really be able to to cope with all the changes, it may take take a bit of time. Good. So to illustrate, ah, yeah, that's a. Uh, when I joined Cisco. So I joined Cisco 2007, um, and I joined with one of the students and new graduate program. So a lot of uh, companies, not just Cisco, eh, they have these kind of programs where they take people from the university and then they bring them on board. And normally they have maybe two months to a year of training where they really train them on the skills that the company needs uh, for their job, right? And for me, I think it was very, interesting and a very great growth experience. At this time, uh, I'm very bad in languages. So one of my biggest success ever is actually to be able to, to speak English properly. And at that time, uh, my English level was really, really bad, very, very low. Um, and it was one of my biggest challenges to be able to come to Belgium and start at Cisco with this uh, nice group of people uh, and start really to speak English. I think that was very, very daunting. But okay, I, I made it after a year, I was able to, to kind of switch. And I think that's a, a really good experience, something that I recommend um, when you finish the university, if you could try to find some of these new graduate programs. For Cisco, for example, we have uh, for sales, right? So you go for a whole year, either to Amsterdam or Krakow, um, and then you, you train as a sales specialist. And then normally you go back to your country. Then you also have uh, professional services kind of for implementation and so on. Uh, it's normally six months. I think now they are doing it also in Krakow. So, and then for this one is the technical services. And in this one you have uh, Brussels still or Krakow as well. And in this one, normally you have about two months of training. So they bring you on board, they show you the technology. Uh, and it's almost kind of starting the university again, right? Because uh, you really have uh, a bunch of young people. It's very nice. So for here, one of the things I think that you can see is that I'm actually the only women in the class, right? I must say there was another class. So at the end, we were about eight or nine. But that's a bit of a recurring topic, but at least in technology, I would say. So I think this is a picture that most of you will recognize. That's a picture that I use a lot when I speak to younger people. But the funny thing is like a lot of these things, they don't really know what they are, right? You ask them, okay, do you know what is uh, this um, CD cassette, right? Or the Polaroid, well, Polaroid camera now are a bit more, uh, the, the maps, right? And they don't realize. So, but I show them with that, is the amount of change that you had in the last 20, 30 years. You went from all of that when you had to travel, you know, you didn't almost fit in your car, to literally this. So you have like in your phone, what in 30 years you could not fit in your luggage. So that's a lot to actually cop, right? Um, for, say for example, if Cisco, Cisco is very big on uh, acquisitions, right? So we do develop software uh, or products internally, but we do acquire a lot from the market. And then the interesting thing is um, how much would you guess how many companies since I started working at Cisco did uh, Cisco acquire, right? From 2007 to 2019 today. So that's actually 79 companies. That means like an average of seven companies per year. So that's like seven companies, seven products that we acquire and we need to learn from, right? Not uh, all at the same time, of course, because they are based on, on segment. But um, just to give you an idea that the change we are speaking about, right? I think you, you see that also in the market. So when I started there a couple of years into the company, I was actually struggling. It's like, okay, now I'm in technical services. I do my job. I take cases. There is this new technology coming, VSS, 
uh, okay, I'll learn about it, and then the next one will come, and it's another one, and so on. But how do I know where I want to go? But also, like, I drive my engagements, right? Like, the things that I learn or the engagements, the projects I'm involved with, right? To make sure that I grow, I grow um, as I feel happy, as I feel comfortable. And one of the things that I learn or I use is this uh, VSM. So VSM it stands for Vision, Strategy, Execution, and Measurement, right? And, and I'll show you how how it is. VSM has been used by Cisco, I think, for the last ten years to actually create the company strategy. Now, uh, with the change of leadership, we are moving to something a bit similar, but uh, it's a bit more complete. It's called uh, B2MAM. If you, if you Google it, you will see a bit more information. I'll explain basically this one because it's the one that I use for, for the last 10 years. So I think everybody, and I'm sure you ask it many times, right? What, how do you see yourself in like five or 10 years? And that's something that most of the people will actually answer like, I don't know. I have no idea how do I see myself in five or 10 years, or I don't know where do I see myself. But I think everybody knows what do you like, right? What do you like to do? What do you want to do more of, right? Uh, and that's a bit how I try to help my colleagues or people that we discuss uh, the career path in a way to say, okay, do you like to actually speak with the customer? and have a relationship with the customers? Or do you prefer to actually work a bit in the background, developing the product, but not necessarily being in the front end of uh, the conversations, right? So maybe do you like to do presentations and documentation? Do you like to teach, right? So those are actually questions where you can actually start narrowing down the things that you like to do. Do you want to focus just in technology to be like, the most uh, specialized in one single thing? Or do you want to be a generalist? Do you want to understand how everything works together? So uh, there, this way you start to narrow it down. And then in the vision, you never ever put a specific role, right? Why? Because in like five, 10 years, uh, the role may not be there. You want to be the director of engineering. Maybe in 10 years, engineering is not there anymore. Maybe it's outsourced somewhere, right? or maybe doesn't exist at all. And you have seen that a lot of the jobs or the jobs that we all knew and love, uh, they have been maybe disappearing or evolving in some way. So that the vision is a bit uh, this, right? What do you like? What, where do you see yourself in five, 10 years? So then once you understand where you want to be, you create a, a strategy. That's like a singular statement of what you are gonna do, right? Uh, and it could be a lot of different things, but it really should show the way you are gonna move. So is that gonna be, for example, uh, you want to change a lot the companies, right? Say, so I want to have the experience of working in 10 different companies in the next 10 years, right? Uh, maybe you want to learn something very specific, right? So uh, maybe your strategy is to actually join a, join a, a PhD in some specialization. So you really go, like the general idea what you will do in the next two or four years. And then you prioritize by focus areas, right? You say, okay, this year I will focus in business. This year I will focus uh, in some specific technology or some specific training, for example, leadership, right? But it always needs to follow the strategy and it always needs to help your vision. And then for that, every year, 12 to 18 months, you need to agree on what you are going to execute to. Uh, and that could be a training, that could be a specific project, and so on and so forth. I'll show you uh, my example in a bit. And then the last one is the measurement, right? And the measurement, I must say, for me, it's always a bit the more complicated part of it. So the measurement, it's something that really ask yourself, OK, if I do that, how am I successful, right? What does it mean success for me if I participate in this project, if I do um, this engagement, if I follow this train, right? Um, also, I think it's always good when you are involved in something, what is your exit strategy, right? I think I see it a lot in the company. You get involved in some projects or in some initiative, 
and you could be actually engaged there forever. There is no end to this, right? You always need to look into, okay, we start a project, it has a continuity, how are we successful, and when is that going to finish, or which is your exit strategy to finalize, because otherwise there is a risk of getting stuck, right, of really kind of just going with the flow and following these kind of projects that take maybe a lot of time, but don't actually contribute to your pitch. So I'll give you uh, the example of myself. So for example, for me, I did like, I always liked very much the, the technology, but I really like to link it with the business, right? So there I thought, okay, if I change the processor uh, on this server, right? Is that going to have any impact on the business of my customer? I really would love to have this kind of uh, granularity to really see end to end how things affect to each other, right? I actually, I quite like to, to work globally, to have like many stakeholders. Um, for Cisco, it's an American company, so we do a lot of work with US. Uh, for time zones also, we work a lot uh, with India to have a really understanding of this global. I think I wouldn't like personally to be in a more local environment or, you know, currently I'm living in, in Brussels, maybe just to work with the Brussels customers or if I move to Spain just to work with the Spanish customers, I really like to have this global environment, right? So that's something I put also in my vision. And that helps me to, if I have an opportunity, well, Esther, uh, we, we would like you to join the local sales teams, right? So I come back to my vision. I say, okay, this actually doesn't really help me much in the global part of it. So is that something that I really want to do? Or maybe I should wait for an opportunity where the sales position is more European than actually uh, locally, right? And then I think what is most important is this synchronization or having a good balance uh, career and personal life. Um, am I always achieving it? I, I don't think so. But I think that's something that everybody needs to, to thrive through, to have uh, to not work for living, uh, but really or the other way right? not living for working, but really working for living, right? So then there I thought, okay, what is my strategy? So uh, in Cisco, we have a concept that is education, exposure, and experience. So we always say that education is about maybe 10, 15%. So, and that means training. So you go to take a training um, of public speaking or leadership. But then the other 80%, 75%, that's exposure, right? So when I learn something, in which projects uh, I can go or where can I have exposure, so I really understand it and I am really, um, how do you say that, embedded, right, to my knowledge. So I think that is very important to have this exposure because otherwise with a training, you kind of finish there and eventually you forget about it. But if you have the real experience and exposure, I think that's uh, the most important. And at the end of the day, experience, how do you become an expert on this matter, right? And I think having this kind of teaching and presenting is really the one, some of the last steps. And here, I always, this change a bit, right? So these strategy areas, they may change depending on where I was, right? Because uh, I may be doing more a specific part of the business, or maybe I wasn't focused so much in business, but I was focused more on technology. And that may, may change a bit. Uh, maybe every couple of years, I put like new uh, blocks there. But I always look, okay, what am I doing for business? What am I doing for technology? And what am I doing for education? And I think personally, that worked very well because as you see, I put here some of the uh, certifications I, I took over the lead years. And I think that's one of the uh, tools that really allowed me to have uh, a balance, right? So for example, um, at the beginning, I started with technology. So I did uh, the CCIE and routing and switching, the CCIE in data center. I think normally those are really engagements uh, of a year. So really a year where you need to um, focus and put yourself uh, into study mode and practice and so on and so forth. But then after that, I thought, okay, uh, now I need to go learn a bit about business, right? So I joined here in Belgium uh, an MBA. Um, I really like MBA, 
was something interesting because a lot of people are very in favor of the MBA. A lot of people believe that you can actually get most of the knowledge in the field. But for me, the experience was really a lot about knowing different people from different fields, right? I think when you are in a specific field, as specialized as uh, I am in Cisco, it's very difficult to broaden your environment and to really see like all the different parts of a company and how they interact together. So that was for me one of the biggest um, takeaways, I would say, from, from the MBA. And then here, for example, uh, as personal education, I do focus a lot also in public speaking. Uh, Toastmasters, uh, I'll give you a bit more information afterwards. Um, of course, lots of, of soft skills trainings, leadership. I also got uh, the CHI, so that's the Cambridge uh, Advanced um, English titulation, right? There, it was a bit of a personal goal because I thought, okay, after uh, 10 years of speaking English, I need to test if my English is kind of okay or it's a disaster, but then I got it. And then here, one of my recommendations as well, I do tend to get involved in a lot of things, right? So maybe I finish with too many executions. So I think it's always good to have a bit of a sprint to say, okay, during this month, which part am I going to focus, right? So for example, um, if you say, okay, these two months I'm going to focus in this execution, right? So I feel foundation and practitioner. Um, and of course, this I didn't get all of that in one single year. Eh? That's like a summary of many years of working on that. But then all of that nicely fits into this bridging the gap between business and technology, yeah? seeing how you, where you want to be in five uh, or 30 years. And I think one of the... Um, questions, right, that uh, we always ask ourselves. You know, I don't know if you know a bit about, uh, we call it like titulitis. For me, I think it's important to, if you have a specialization or if you have knowledge, to try to have also um, a titulation attached to it, right? So I think that's something uh, that you can put in your CV. But of course, when you do have an interview, you need to be able to, to justify it, right? Or really to show the knowledge that you got in. So then, once you have your training plan, how do I maximize uh, myself? How do you make sure that in the position you are, you get the best of yourself? And I think for a lot, I mean, I thought about a lot about it, right? And there is always something that is unique about yourself. And not every time, maybe actually, you, you may not see it. It may not be that obvious because, uh, you know, you think it's normal. And I think, the younger people or the youth may not have this understanding. I think it's very difficult maybe to get that in the school, on the university, but you're starting to show signs of it. And I think very specific tools that uh, I use, uh, feedback is very important. I think for anything to you do, ask feedback. What am I doing well? What I can improve? What am I doing wrong? I think feedback is something that uh, everybody needs to live by. I don't think that um, it's always difficult sometimes to, to hear the feedback. Not all the feedback is nice, but I think it's necessary uh, to be able to be resilient, right? To really understand yourself uh, now and in the future. And then here I put two kind of um, personality tests. I think you may see some of those, right? I think instinctive drive is one that uh, I like quite a lot. So there it really shows what is your instinct, right? Or what it drives you. For me, for example, I'm a, what they call a high improviser. So when I work, I do like to work with uncertainty. I do like to, to work on an improvising environment. I think one of um, the tests that it was very funny, so we were having a kickoff uh, from my new team two or three years ago. And we went through the profiles of everybody. That I think is very nice. You sit together with your team, you explain your profile, and you tell them, okay, what you like, how they work with you best, and so on and so forth. And then one of the teachers, the facilitator, right, was asking me, like, you know, if Chuck, for example, tomorrow joins you in the lift and he asks you, okay, in five minutes, can you present uh, this topic or like your team, right? And everybody in the room went like back saying, no, no, I cannot do that. And me, myself, being an improviser, I went going in front. I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to. 
to do that. And here you have some of uh, these tests that I think that are quite interesting to know yourself and also to know uh, your colleagues, right? So then I think this, you add it with your strengths. Everybody has strengths, like everybody says, okay, I know or I learn easily mathematics or I know a lot about languages. I'm a bit, really big uh, history, right? So I think that's something that uh, you need to be aware. Me personally, I know that I'm very bad uh, in languages. I'm not very good like writing anything. Uh, so the weaknesses, you work with them, right? You try that they don't affect your career, but those are not your focal points. And I think at the end, to uh, complement all of that, you need to have some ongoing training. And I believe like in the center of the three of them is where you can maximize yourself. So now I'll change a bit of the topic. That's a bit of the tools I use to, to develop myself. Um, and here is one of my, my passions. So I, I'm really involved in diversity in the STEM careers. And that started about uh, seven, eight years ago, right? When we actually saw that in Cisco, I think we had an okay uh, pool of talent, not enough to be diverse, right? Or 50-50 in gender equality. Uh, however, you saw that a lot of this talent was actually leaking. They were going to roles that would be maybe more business or more project management. And we start asking people, okay, well, women uh, in particular, why are you moving to these non-technical roles? Why is, what is it missing in the technical roles? And we discovered that uh, a lot of times they were missing a bit the community, right? So for a lot of times I was actually, um, the only women in my team, right? And you may not realize at that time, but that's, that it does has an effect, right? You need a bit more people as uh, yourself to network. What we saw as well is we didn't have a good pipeline. We didn't have young girls and women that uh, were joining the company, right? And we were asking ourselves, why? Why is uh, this happening? So then what we decided to create a community inside Cisco first in Belgium, and then we joined uh, different communities where we started to do activities, that being training, uh, that being networking events, or participating with different NGOs to actually grow the, the female talent. And this in 2014, thanks to, uh, to all these initiatives that we were running in Cisco, um, I got the, the award of Digital European Woman in 2014. And that actually gave me a great experience uh, in the field. So I was able to join the UN Women, right, the conference. So I was part of uh, Brussels, Barcelona, IOITA conference. I was able to give um, a keynote for the She Goes ICT. So that's like uh, an award that they are giving to the local talent, right? And then many more. So I'm really involved into uh, the girls in ICT day. That's like also a full day event where you show technology to the girls. We have also the jump forum. So that's a forum in, in Belgium where we actually were able to bring us, but a lot of our colleagues. So they also became a bit more aware of what is being the only boy or the only girl in the, in the community, right? So that was very interesting as well. This is the cybersecurity conference. So I was able to be in a, panel, in a panel for education. And then this is the Woman of Impact. So the Woman of Impact is a worldwide conference that uh, Cisco is organizing. It's starting in Japan and it's finishing in San Jose. So it almost lasts 24 hours. And there, um, I always organize either locally or the main event in Belgium. So that's also something that was it is very interesting for me. And this is one of uh, my passions as well. So there is one organization is named Green Light for Girls. So here, what we see is that, okay, one of the big problems is that we are missing female talent that comes into the companies, right? But to actually attract female talent, it's very, you don't start in the university. They already have chosen their career. So we need to go much before. We really need to start working uh, with everybody, you and the girls, when they are younger, right? From 10, 12, when they start to, to know the technology. So all this group is actually from my hometown. We organized this year the fourth event that we have organized in Spain. 
Um, and it's basically a whole day of workshops where Cisco and a lot of uh, different partners come together to a university. And here is, I came back to, to my own university, Alasalle. And here what we do is really to show the girls how things work and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a really nice event. If you want to participate, check out if you have a local one. I think it's very worth it, either to volunteer or to bring uh, your daughters there. And then just to give you a bit more thoughts eh, in gender diversity or gender equality, we are not doing very well uh, also in Cisco. We do put a lot of effort and a lot of resources. And for me, there is four keys, more about well, five keys more or less that you need to, to look for. So one of the things is like show why. In general, women, they really need to understand why things are done, right? Doesn't mean that men don't. Yeah, that's like, that's uh, very clear. But as a generalization, we really need to understand, okay, why do you use something? Does it has an impact? We need to go a step further. So then you need also to have, to actually have a good uh, diverse uh, pool. You need to have diverse leadership. That's very important. A diverse pipeline. So you really need to have a pipeline where you can choose from. I think that's a very in nice focus. And a diverse panel. And that's for everything. If you want to have diversity in your team, it cannot be always the same roles um, interviewing. I think that seems very logical, but that's actually not always the case. Uh, and then, of course, marketing. How is your career or your school or your company being marketed? And I always like to put the example of two movies, right? Is your company looking more as like sex in the city or is it your company looking more as the expendables right and i think honestly if you see cisco in a lot of cases it is very clear that we look like the expendables and for that a lot of times we do have uh, issues attracting female talent right so i think you really need to be conscious your organization what is the view and the market that you you want to put out there Good. So then I'll give you a bit of recommendations because I think we are two or five minutes uh, until the Q&A, so I don't want to, to bore you more. Uh, for public speaking, I think one of the biggest things that really helped me out it was Toastmasters. For me, it's something that it's a must-have for any career. You need to be able to communicate yourself, to present, to share the message. I think that is very important. So here, uh, you have the link if you want to find a club. There is clubs everywhere. You can also learn about leadership. That was really nice uh, learning path for me. Another pointer, why, 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 right? So this is the Golden Cycle by Simon. Uh, it's a very famous TED talk, but I think it also applies everywhere, right? If you want somebody to do something, um, if you want to start a company, don't start with what? or how, really start with why, right? Why are we doing it this way? Uh, so I think it's very, if not the tech talk, is also a very good read. So for resilience, right? Something that I learned in the last couple of years is actually improvisation. So improvisation, uh, well, I thought it's uh, from the theater, uh, literally, so like a theater uh, kind of uh, expertise. And it has six uh, habits that I think they can be really applied to anything you do. So one is say yes and. So normally we always say, okay, yes, but listen to yourself, right? When you speak with somebody, oh yeah, yeah, I really like it, but, right? So that's very difficult to have a conversation like that. So then be flexible, be in the moment, right? Experiment, try different things, different ways. Um, follow your intuition. A lot of people say that your intuition is actually kind of the knowledge that you have at the back of your mind, right? Make other people look good and also there to fail. I think that's uh, kind of the seven habits of an improviser that can apply very much to, to what we do. Also, a bit of a balance. When I say about balancing life, it seems that the work, uh, the, the brain, it actually works in a two different ways. When you are focused, very focused in something, 
and then when you are diffuse. And the funny thing is like, do you remember uh, when sometimes you are in the shower, you have a great idea, uh, or you go to the bathroom and then suddenly you solve the problem, right? So that's why, why that happens, because your brain actually zooms up and knows how to, to solve the issue. So give it some thought as well to, to understand how important it is to have this uh, downtime, right, to yourself uh, and to others. And then lastly, I wanted to speak a couple of words about innovation. So nobody has time for innovation, but I think it's very important to, to invest on it. Uh, to have the idea is actually just a 1%, like most of it, the 99% uh, is to actually being able to implement it. And I leave you here uh, some books that actually work very well for me to have a better understanding of the whole innovation path. So that's the uh, this function, the five things functions of a team, the business model legend generation, and the lean start. And I think more or less, um, Adri, we should leave it here because I think it's almost time for questions. Yes, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think it uh, sparked a lot of interest because we received a few questions. Cool. So let me just uh, <laughs> let me just read um, the first one. Uh, these were two similar questions. Uh, but we can address both of them. So um, one of the participants was asking, how did you manage your time to achieve so many different things, different achievements, different, yeah, different experiences? And another participant um, asked, what is your advice about time management? So uh, these are quite related, but so the time management. Yeah, when I started at Cisco, that that was one of the things that um, I struggled the most. So I started in a department where uh, we were taking, I mean, issues, right? Like a customer would open a case, and we'll get it. And the funny thing is, like, we really get or got like a lot of work, right? And we really need to work very efficiently. And one of the books that I actually got is uh, Getting Things Done. So I don't know if you you know about this one. So it's, uh, I'll put it in the chat, Getting Things Done. And I mean, there are different um, ways of doing things, right? But I think you need to try to be very efficient with, with your time, right? So really focus on things that get you results. Also like kind of a 80-20% rule, so normally, uh, and that's a bit, uh, I think you know probably this theory, right? But normally there is to a point where you got, it's not perfect, right? But you maximize the results. And there is all, always like a 20% where you need to put so much effort that actually the return on your investment, is so low, right? And I, it's good because I have a character that I'm quite comfortable with that, right? I'm comfortable, in not having something that is 100%, but that will have a good impact. However, I know that there are some people that do need to get to this 100%. And a lot of times, this last part where you need to put a lot of hours and a lot of effort doesn't get you any return or investment. So be a bit clever or where you put your time, how you put the, your time, and be decisive, you know? A lot of times, there is 20 variables and you want to put them all together and say, okay, how is this affecting this one and so on. You lose so much time that you could have already done it already. You know, like just go and do it. That's a bit my <laughs> my philosophy. Just go and do it. So I don't know if that re uh, replies more or less to the question. I think so. I think uh, it's also encouraging the conversation now in the chat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, I think it... it uh... It did. Um, we have another question that says, have you ever met any difficulty during the period when you made your first steps in your career? Yeah, I mean, so generally, um, I'm a bit naive, huh? so like I've always tried to get the best of life and I'm very positive and so on and so forth. I must say the first year, um, it was difficult because uh, it was a new city. I mean, thanks goodness I had some friends from the university and the people I was starting with were really young, but uh, it was very 
high stress environment and not everybody uh, is made to start in this environment, I must say. Um, I didn't know English, right? So I can imagine I would have like 20 Americans on the phone and I couldn't handle the, the conversation. But okay, I thought to myself, look, Esther, focus on the good things. I finished my career. I'm in a very good company. I'm learning a lot, okay? Things will eventually come, right? Um, I try to work with people as well. A lot of people support me all the time. They encourage me, right, in work. I have uh, very good friends where you will go and say, oh my God, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not good enough to do that. And they will come and tell you, no, Esther, you are so good, go and do it. And then the next day they come to you and they say, oh my God, I'm not sure if I can do that. You know, be vulnerable because people will help you and people will really um, try to work with you to improve things, I think. Um, so that's, I think, one of the main challenges was really the first year to be able to to learn English and also to be in a new country with a new company. Uh, but I must say, I'm always very, very positive, right? So that uh, made it easier for me. Thank you. I think I, what I find really interesting is that these things that you were saying about, for example, time management or the things that you faced uh, at the beginning of your career, I think these are things that uh, can be, well, can be the same across all STEM careers and all careers. Uh, so I think everyone can really learn from it because it's not really just specific to this one profile, but uh, yeah. it's specific to everyone who's starting out their career yeah. and trying to be ambitious in their career. No, absolutely. And I would say for all of this, it's very, very important to know yourself, right? I think um, mm -hmm. me, I may feel very comfortable doing it this way. But for somebody else, uh, it may be very difficult. So you need to learn a bit, your, like know yourself, know your strengths, how to work with other people. And maybe look, the place where you started with or the role that you had is not the best for you. And that's not a problem, right? That's, you shouldn't be ashamed. You really need to look, okay, what is the role that really fits my expertise? You may be a person that is super detailed, that loves detail. And there are so many jobs that you need to be very detailist. I mean, uh, for security, right? If you need to do a security assessment, I will never be able to do that. It's like so much detail you go need it to go through. But you maybe are the perfect person for that, right? So know yourself. I think that's very, very important. Yeah, exactly. Um, another question we have is, uh, do you participate uh, at times in uh, sharing experiences with uh, pupils? face to face, for example, or even online, if you have any similar sessions where you share your experiences with uh, students? Ah, with the students. So we do have different uh, initiatives. So it may go uh, youngsters coming to to Cisco or, or may go into like the university, normally my old university. Um, we do have kind of these sharing experiences. A lot of times, maybe like self-organized, right? So we reach out to some organization. Sometimes they reach out to us. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the things um, I love the most. Once I was two years ago with like, um, I think it was 10 years old entrepreneurs. So I went there and I would have like a kind of a <laughs> kind of presentation about that. Uh, I'm trying to go also to my hometown to, to share a bit more about technology. But I think that's one of the very fulfilling things if you can kind of pass your knowledge to the next generation. Yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Um, and one of the last questions is, uh, did you have a role model or, or a person that inspired you? So in general, yes. no, I, I must say, I don't have like a specific role model. I always sometimes I come back to a lot of uh, the TV that you see when you're young, right? And I think um, it's very important to have a strong and different role models there, not just uh, kind of the, the Disney princess. <laughs> One of the good things that uh, I had, I think, in my life is I wasn't especially, uh, how you say, limited, you know? Uh, a lot of times your parents or your family will limit yourself, uh, but then they've been always quite supportive uh, when they saw that, okay, what I wanted to do. 
made sense, right? So I think this is very important. And now, when I started to work in the company or in the university, you always have some inspiring people that you meet, right? That you look up to. Of course, those, I have uh, many of them for many uh, of the specializations, right? I have leaders that I really look to, um, or colleagues, you know, that I find very proficient in something that I'm very much lacking. And then I rely on them or I look up to them for this kind of expertise, right? Thank you. Um, we have two more questions. What are the greatest challenges of your job currently? So for me, it's really, I think, keeping up to date. That's uh, something that uh, is quite that challenging, right? If you want to stay relevant in the technology, I mean, you have two options. You learn everything or you kind of put your eggs in a basket and you say, okay, I think this is the technology that will grow and that will actually help me out in my career. But it's quite a big portfolio, I must say. Uh, there are a lot of things happening at the same time. So a lot of times, and especially for me, it's very difficult to say, okay, where should I focus, right? Where should I put my, my eggs? I think that's uh, quite challenging. Thank you. And last question, or maybe we have time for two. No, I, I think this is the last question I can ask you is, um, so one of the participants, he says, or she says that uh, they have Cisco Academy at their school, and uh, they would like to encourage their students to participate. Um, what do you think they can tell their students to empower them to take the course? And these are students between the ages of 14 and 18. Yeah, so I think for me, it's very important to show them real life applications, right? Because otherwise, honestly, like when I was in the university, it was very interesting for me. But an 18, 14, 18, if you ask me, configure the switch, uh, it would be boring. Huh? That's uh, You have like a command line, you put some IP. So what we do sometimes for these um, events, right? So for example, we create like a website. Right. And then we help them into configure the network and then we ask them to access to the website with their phone. Right. So they ask uh, the access there. So for me, if they can really see what they are learning, how they can use in real life, that will encourage them to to be there. And maybe instead of like, OK, just go and do the video online or do the presentation. Why not try to do a bit more a game? Right. Uh, once what we had is that was uh, yeah, the packet switching. So instead of actually going and configuring it, we actually put uh, some uh, baskets, right? Uh, and there, I think we have actually, I'll put the chat in the chat. I think it's each packet system. So you actually play with them. And what they do is just like, they throw the packets, right? And then they, they really see in real life how that works. Uh, the link is not working anymore. But that, that that's a funny game. So try to really put it in a way that they can understand. I think that's much easier. Mm. Yeah. And I think, can I answer, I think uh, Banu is also asking about working with men and being the only women if you can actually get more <laughs> masculine. I think this is actually mm -hmm. a quite interesting question because we see this feedback a lot, right? That when you have female leaders, they have actually more masculine um, traits, right? That doesn't mean that they are masculine, but maybe they are actually a strong character or things that are more uh, masculine features, right? So to there, I can say only just be yourself, right? I think in the leadership scenario or uh, in the different careers, it's not like about being a man or, or a woman. It's really about, okay, what do you bring in the table and what is considered as um, like the traits that should be in this role. And I think leadership is changing and it's changing a lot. And there is going to be uh, really space for both men characteristics and women characteristics. But yeah, that's something that I think is easier to, to maybe fall into, right? To do as the others do. So I think that's a, it's a very interesting question. It depends on, on the individual's 
strengths and passions, of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for answering all these questions and for the presentation. I think it was very interesting for me personally okay. and then hopefully for the participants as well. Um, now I also want to thank participants for attending. Uh, thank you for being here and listening to this presentation. Uh, we would appreciate if you could fill in uh, the survey that my colleague just posted uh, in the chat. Uh, this will give us a good insight of uh, your opinion on the webinar and how we can improve. It will take less than three minutes of your time and uh, it would be a great help for us. So you can see the, the um, link, yes, now in the chat. And when you fill out the form, you will see a field. Uh, where you can also request a certificate for attending this webinar. So I think that will be all for today. Thank you very much for attending again, and thank you, Esther, very much for your presentation. Great, thank you very much for organizing it. <laughs> thank you, and hope to see all participants in, in future webinars as well. Bye. Bye.